Good morning. I hope everyone is as awake as I am. For some reason, my body decided that 4 a.m. was a great time to wake up. I disagreed, but we couldn't settle. My name is Dirk Hondel. I'm uh, <laughs> freshly, not quite freshly, at VMware. I'm the chief open source officer for VMware. And I'm Linus, and I have been around the Linux Foundation for the last seven years, so not so fresh anymore. Seven? Uh, no, it must be nine. Twelve. Whatever. Something. <laughs> the Linux Long Foundation time. was founded in 2007, and before that you worked for OSDL. Yeah, no. Anyway, clearly we are well prepared for this morning. <laughs> numbers. Numbers. Speaking of numbers, 4.8 RC3, where are we? Um, this looks to be a fairly regular release. 4.7 is smaller than traditional. Well, not traditional, uh, lately. And that was, I blame it on just being summer in the northern hemisphere, which tends to slow things down a bit. The poor Australians will just have to take a break with the rest of us. Um, but but 4.8 looks very normal. Um, it, our development really has been fairly smooth lately. We have a very regular uh, schedule for releases, and, uh, and everybody knows how things work by now. I mean, we've only been doing it for the last 10 years this way, uh, and, and things are looking on track. But it, we still have at least four more weeks until the actual 4.8 release. Anything exciting in it? Anything noteworthy? Um, I'm actually, right now, when it comes to exciting things, I'm looking at 4.9, mm -hmm. so I know some of what's coming up for the next merge window. So 4.8 to me is already old news because all the exciting stuff was merged in the merge window. Uh, for 4.9 we have, uh, what I've been surprised about is that we, we're still doing low level stuff. Mm -hmm. We're still doing, uh, for a while there it looked like we're only doing drivers and we're only doing file systems, like new file system every like clockwork several times a year. And, and then something changed, and now we've been doing low-level stuff, like really low-level people rewriting assembly code, changing how the stack layout is, things like that. So that's, to me, exciting. To most users, not so much, right? But. So, of course, I, I had to start with something else, but everyone expects us to talk about 25 years yeah. of Linux. Now, the critical question, what is the correct date to celebrate? Is it really August 25th when you wrote the email, or is it the first release, or? I think August 25th is probably the correct one because the first actual release was not public. So um, when I released 0 0.01, which was September 7 or 15 or something like that, uh, so two, three weeks from now, um, I wasn't quite happy with it, but I told people that I'm going to release. So what I, happened was I, I made a release on a public website, but then, or at that point, FTP site, but then <laughs> I didn't actually announce it publicly, and I just emailed the people who knew and had shown interest. And I've lost all those emails. So I don't actually have an exact date, except you can go back and find a copy of the original tar file and look at the date in the make file and that's how I think it's a, I forget which date it is. But, but the one public announcement was obviously uh, the August 25 one and that's the one that I think most people use and certainly the Linux Foundation uses. So I, I, this, of course, this email has been shown many, many times and I'm always amused by your predictions in that email. And, and the, the accuracy that you have shown. Mm -hmm. You said it's not portable, and we today support 80 different architectures, something I like that. I don't think it's 80, but it's With a the sub-architectures, yeah. yeah no. um, it's more than anybody else, so. You said you would never support anything but AT hard disks. Because it was what I had, yeah. right? <laughs> well, I mean, you had to realize the, the background there is that it was a completely personal project. And I didn't really, I mean, I expected other people to be interested from a theoretical standpoint. Like, OK, students of operating systems might want to look at, OK, here's another operating system that we can look at, right? That was my expectation, which meant that the kind of hardware I had was 
the only hardware that it ran on. And it wasn't even the kind of hardware. It was literally things like, for the first two or three releases, you not only had to have an AT hard disk like I do, you had to have the same AT hard disk as I had because the geometry of the hard disk was hard-coded in the source code, <laughs> right? Which, I mean, you could have a different AT hard disk, but you just had to change the numbers to match how many sectors you had and things yeah. like that. So the first releases were a bit um, unpolished. Right? <laughs> so, so when I started at, at 011, you already supported any MFM drives, yep. but if you had an RLL drive, uh, so the, the run length compressed ones, there were small inconsistencies? Well, I wouldn't even say any MFM drive. I mean, uh, drivers are still most of what the kernel does, and yeah. the early drivers were slightly less complete than what we have today. <laughs> yes. But um, that is why the early code was 10,000 lines of code, and now we're at 17 million lines of code plus documentation. Yeah, so when, when I started, I, first thing I did was I printed out the sources. I do not recommend you do that today. <laughs> um, but my Very tiny font. Very tiny. Um, but my favorite prediction is always, this won't be big and professional. And obviously, you were correct. This is all pretty amateurish, simple. <laughs> Sorry, Jim, no offense. Yeah, no, it, it took a while, though. I mean, it really did take it did. a while before it turned professional. And some of us still struggle with it at times. <laughs> so what are the highlights or the lowlights of these 25 years? Um, the highlights are really hard to even mention because, I mean, there's, most of it has been really, really good. Uh, but this has got to have been the moment where you said, yeah, this is it. This is awesome. Aren't there these? The moments where I really went, this is awesome, where actually that I remember, like clearly, have been when I've been struggling with something that just took forever. Like I was struggling on the same thing for weeks and nothing worked. And most of those were actually very, very early on. Mm -hmm. The reason nobody sane does operating systems from scratch is that when nothing works, it is really, really frustrating. But then even the slightest sign of life makes you go, wow, I really mastered this machine. When you, that first character shows up on the screen ever, and the system does nothing else, right? You're, you're really pumped because you actually get, got a character on the screen. Wow, right, completely useless, but that, those, Early times were actually some of the most like memorable for me when when nothing really worked and you go from from that nothing to to something. Uh, later on and these days, I'm actually most happy about when process works because I don't write code anymore. So I don't have any code I can be proud of because I send off emails to random people and say, hey. This guy reports a bug. Can you, you are the expert in this area. Can you fix it? So I don't have code that I can be proud of. I'm making things work. Um, I can be proud of when, when the release process really works and people, people get things done and we don't have a lot of issues. So that's, that makes me happy these days. But that really has been working very well for, for a while. Low lights? Uh, we've had some. Uh, most of them have, uh, almost none of them have been about technology. I mean, we had, we've had difficult times when things really didn't make progress. Uh, some people who, I mean, the developers in the audience may remember, who, if, if you've been around for long enough, power management was such a bummer for so many years. And we really struggled with that. And it took years and years to get it to the point where you could just take a random laptop and suspend it and resume it, and you would just assume that it works. That was very frustrating. But on the whole, lowlights on the technical side have not been a big issue. I mean, you have frustrating issues that come up and are hard to debug, but, but most of the lowlights have been um, really the social and, and especially, again, the uh, development side when the process doesn't work. 
I mean, if you go back 15 years ago, we had huge process issues. We really had, uh, during the 2.4 series, we, we really, and I'll take blame, I screwed up the memory management, and, and we had this situation where during a few releases, we completely switched around which memory manager. I think Andrea might be here somewhere. He, he ended up fixing a lot of things, and it was very, very, very painful. And, and, and that I still remember as a low light and as a, this is not how we're supposed to do it. Uh, but, but, for example, switching over to BitKeeper. I mean, everybody has heard about how BitKeeper was a big failure and how that brouhaha when, when I had to go off and make Git work. But BitKeeper actually was a big savior for me personally because the situation we were in from a process standpoint before BitKeeper was such a disaster. And, and people may not realize because a lot of peop Linux people have come in fairly lately, but, but 15 years ago, we were going from there was a fair amount of commercial interest, but it was still fairly early. And, and our processes at the time were geared towards the pre-commercial interest models that we had when we had a lot of, of individuals at universities and our kernel was much smaller. We had maybe 10 to 50 developers and then all these big commercial companies come in and now we have hundreds of developers and lots of new code and lots of problems that we didn't have to face before and our process was just a mess and it was very painful. And that was probably the only time in the history of Linux where I was like, this is not working and, and I felt like, like in, in retrospect, I look back and say that might have been the moment where I just gave up, right? Uh, and, but that was 15 years ago. And we had problems after that, but literally for the last few years, the release schedule and everything has been so smooth and, and we have thousands of people involved and it's working. I mean, don't get me wrong, we still argue. I mean, there are arguments. We're, <laughs> we're, we're not all happy people. We don't love each other. Uh, I, I suspect a lot of developers really don't like each other, but quite often, even if there's not a lot of happy love feelings, there's, I, I get the feeling that there's a lot of respect for the technical side and, and things are working very well in ways that things have not always worked. I find it interesting that you mentioned that. So did you ever really consider walking away from it saying, I'm done? It's never been at that point. Uh, there's been a couple of times where I decided that we had um, had big enough arguments that I took a week when I just... Actually, it never ended up being a week, but I decided that I'm, I'm walking away from the computer. I am too angry at the people involved. Uh, this is actually not lately. This, most of these go really back 10, 15 years ago. And, and I decide I will be offline for a week because I can't, I am just not able to take this anymore. And usually the next day I'm back and things are better. But, but it, it's been a couple of times that has happened where, where I felt like this is, this is not fun, this is not worth my time. But, but it not, not in the last 10 years at least. But I mean, if I, if I look at the 25 years of Linux development overall, the, the amount of success that, that we made as a community, the, what we've created is impressive. And to, to look back and say, I can't really think of any lowlights, that alone is impressive. There are well, I mean, I can think of it, but, but they have been very rare. I mean, they have not been, it, it, it's been a great community. I, it yes. really, I mean, we're, we're actually somewhat famous. I mean, the kernel mailing list is famous for not being a great community, but that to, to a large degree it's been because people then highlight the, the bad things going on. And if you actually, it's, people are so nice in general. People are, I wouldn't say polite. Very many people are never, ever polite. But, but people are like, you can just feel the fact that people want to work together and want to make a better system, and that really makes for a great community. 
But as a, as a kernel community over the last 25 years, there have been challenges, at least challenges that were talked about. Mm -hmm. One of the ones that always came up, and I remember this in, in the early days when uh, SMP was introduced, was the question of fragmentation. How do we keep one single kernel? What's your thought on the technical debt in the Android kernels by all the different vendors that are so far away from, from mainstream? I mean, I used to be worried about fragmentation, and I used to think that it was inevitable at some point. Uh, uh, part of that was obviously the history of Unix, mm -hmm. where everybody who was looking at history of Unix and comparing Linux to traditional Unix was like saying, it's going to fail because it's going to fragment because that's what happened before, and we've seen this, and why even bother, right? Um, and uh, there, I think the license made a huge difference. Uh, me and the FSF, we don't have this loving relationship, but I love the GPL version too. I, I really think the license has been one of the defining factors in the success of Linux, because the, the whole enforced you have to give back uh, ha has meant that the fragmentation has never been something that has been viable from a technical standpoint. Uh, Fragmentation can still happen due to social issues or just my biggest fear was that fragmentation would happen due to uh, different markets mm -hmm. where um, originally when SGI was pushing Linux into thousand core machines and our SMP was kind of wobbly even on eight CPUs. I mean, it was, it was good if you had two. It was okay to, if you had four. Eight was kind of pushing it, really, obviously. And then SGI comes along and said, yeah, we have this 256 CPU machine, and next year we want to put it on 1024, and long term more. And I was like, they wanted to talk to me about how to manage this, and I told them that, yeah, you should just go off and do your own thing, because we're not there. You should do your own big iron version of Linux. And, and sell it as SGI Linux, and it's fine, right? And they did to some degree, but they kept moving things back, and, and the standard kernel also kept trying. I mean, that's where the license comes in, that the code is out there, and you have all these people who can try to merge it back because anybody can do that. And, uh, and we ended up just improving to the point where our limits from the standard kernel went away, and the SGI people were really happy to try to push their code to us so that they'd have less maintenance headaches with all the changes they did. And, and that experience just convinced me that even if you have completely disparate machines and, and uh, target markets, we really can have a sim single image from the source code standpoint. And, uh, Right now we're seeing, you mentioned Android, it's not, I don't think it's a huge deal. Uh, the biggest problem with Android is that in the embedded market on the cell phones, people are used to, you have this odd dichotomy where the hardware is the newest of the new, right? There's a new chip coming out and three weeks later there's a prototype phone and two months later in some parts of the world, there's actually a phone on the shelves with this new hardware by, by a hardware manufacturer. But they have this model where software tends to lag by much more than that. So the software versions are often like two years old or a year and a half old because that's what they had and, and hardware de developers are really excited about new hardware but they just want to run the old software and then they hack it up to work on new hardware. So that has been some of a problem always in the embedded space and, and now in Android, but, but even that is actually getting better. So you mentioned the, the strength of the GPL. Many new kernels have shown up in the last couple of years, mostly geared towards really small devices, the IoT space, so Zephyr mm -hmm. by Intel, now Fuchsia by Google, there are a bunch more. And one of the interesting commonalities is that they're all under BSD or MIT. Right. Um, do you think that, well, A, do you think they're interesting? B, do you think that one of them could grow up and become a competitor for Linux or replace Linux? So I, 
I think they're interesting just because I, I, it's where Linux came out of, too, like small devices running tiny kernels that only were very limited. And, and I think it's, it's always an interesting space, and it's the only reasonable space where a new operating system can really make a big impact because the complexities of an operating system tend to be in, in all the hardware support and the flexibility of supporting lots of different use cases. So if you start off, you need to start off with something small. And then today, that means IoT. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, the reason I think they show up under the MIT license or BSD or, or Apache is that most of the time, these projects are started by companies. And uh, the flexibility for them to use something like a BSD license that allows them to do anything, uh, they see that as a big upside. And I think that if you actually want to create something bigger, and if you want to create a community around it, uh, the BSD license is not necessarily a great license. I mean, I, it's, it's worked fairly well, uh, but you are going to have trouble finding outside developers who feel protected by a big company that says, hey, here's this BSD license thing, and we're not making any promises because the copyright allows us to do anything. It allows you to do anything, too. But, but as an outside developer, I would not get the warm and fuzzies by that because I'm like, oh, this big company is going to take advantage of me. While the GPL says, yes, the company may be, may be big, but nobody is ever going to take advantage of your code. It will remain free and nobody can take that away from you. And, and uh, I think that's a big deal for community management. It wasn't something I was planning personally when I started, but over the years I've become convinced that the BSD license is great for code you don't care about. The, for code you want to make, like this is, I'll use it myself. If there's a library routine that I just want to say, hey, this is really useful to anybody and I'm not going to maintain this, I'll put it under BSD license. And, but I mean, I, I do want to, whenever licenses come up, I want to always say that, hey, this is a personal issue. Some people love the BSD license. Some people love proprietary licenses. And you know what? I understand that. I'm like, if you want to make a program and you want to feed your kids, it used to make a lot of sense to say that you want to have a proprietary license and sell binaries. I think it makes sense, less sense today, but I really understand the argument. So I, I, I don't want to judge. I'm, I'm just kind of giving my view on licensing. That's why we're here. So do you ever look at the sources of these other kernels? Do you say, no. oh, I, you know, it's on the BSD, I can look, I can... No, no, I, I actually used to, uh, not really. I used to try to, let's put it that way. Uh, back in the very early days of Linux, I forget what it was, and, but this is, this was some issue I had, and I tried to figure it out, and I had just hit my head against the wall for a long time. And I said, okay, I, I mean, BSD's out there. I can go and look what BSDs do. And I don't know how much time I wasted trying to follow somebody else's code. I mean, for a complicated problem, too. I mean, it was obviously complicated enough that I had, had issues with it, and I was like, how do I solve this? So. When you have a complicated problem like that, the worst thing you can do is look at somebody else's code. It doesn't matter how much comments it has, it's not going to clarify things for you. It's like you need, you need background to understand source code, right? So I made the mistake once of saying, okay, let's see how anybody else solved this problem. And I found it, I found it not useful for me, and maybe it is useful for others, but I, I just, I, I decided now, it's actually easier to just read up uh, like a paper or a book about this OS design and try to actually understand the problem instead of looking at somebody else's code and, and get it that way. And this may be personal, but after that, I just, after one bad experience, I decided, no, I'd rather read literature than read source code. I'll, I'll read my own, and I really want people to read their own source code. You don't just write it, you read it and try to understand it afterwards too. <laughs> but, but reading another project's source code is really, really hard. 
So which projects do you look at the sources of besides the kernel? Um, honestly, the last project I looked at the source code of was Zmailer, <laughs> which is a old mailer program that is still used by V'ger, the kernel mailing list, and nobody else. And it hasn't been maintained for 10 years and, or more. And uh, so the only way to figure out problems is to look at source code. And I did figure out a few problems, and we fixed a few issues on the kernel mailing list with email authentication issues we had. Uh, so I think it actually is useful to look at other projects' code if you want to fix a bug in that other project. I mean, yeah. that is how we get most of the kernel developers. Is they, a lot of bugs are really easy to fix. They may be one-liners, right? You don't look at a project code to write your own. You look at a project code because you want to fix that project. And you start out small, and then 25 years later, you find out that you're a big maintainer. <laughs> That's how we all start. Yes. So, so let's talk a bit about this big maintainer thing. Um, one thing that I find fascinating about the, the Linux development process is it's completely unique in its scale, in its velocity. Um, do you think this is something that other projects or even companies for in-house development can learn from? The way Linux does things with the, the clear maintainer roles, with the, the tree structure, with the timed releases and all that? We don't actually have clear maintainer roles. We, really, I mean, I, I doubt anybody here can really even Google and try to find a maintainership like traditional org chart for Linux. Maybe somebody has tried to do this. I, I would guess that maybe you would find it on LWN. You would find it from <laughs> 10 years ago, John Corbett probably tried to make an org chart for Linux, and, and that's why he's bald now. Uh, <laughs> but so the only people who think we have a clear maintainer, there's two classes of people who think we have a clear maintainership role. One is the outsiders. They, my guess is that from the outside, this all looks very organized, right? It, we have releases on every 10 weeks. It looks very organized. It's very smooth. And then the other group is the, the people who have been around forever. And they just know who maintains everybody. Not because there's a documentation, not because we have an org chart. It's just because when you've been around forever, you just know, oh, it's a driver. Uh, Bug, bug Greg about it, or David handles networking, and if it's wireless, you go to somebody else, right? So, so we have maintainership roles, but they're not, they're actually, and I think it's nice that they're not like an org chart, because one of the downsides of org charts, it's all the politics. You want to be up, right? Because it makes you look good. And, and so you have the jockeying for position. And when you don't have an org chart and you can't really show off your position in the org chart to anybody, some of the politics goes away. That's how many of you here work for large companies and know about company politics? <laughs> yeah, some people at least admit to this, right? Uh, but the other thing is we're actually way more flexible when it comes to things. And, and people have been trying out different models like having two or three people work as maintainers of one subsystem. We now have one subsystem that is playing around with having two maintainers, but 15 people who can actually commit, which is, sounds a bit odd, and we don't know if it works, but maybe it will work. We've, we've tried a lot of these kinds of experiments with maintainership, and, uh, and I wouldn't say that most of them work, but the ones, the, the, a lot of changes that on the surface look completely crazy do actually work really well after you give it a few iterations and you kind of make the, the obvious problems that you didn't think about go away. So we have this fairly fluid org chart and it's been, it literally has been changing mm -hmm. and, and, and it's, it's not even, a hierarchy. I would say it's more of a network of people that sometimes it goes across boundaries just because you can. Email doesn't really care who you send it to. Yeah, I, I always love it when you send your patches to some other maintainer 
oh, yeah. integrate them so that later you can pull them. If, if I write code, it depends a bit on the area. Sometimes I will just commit it myself because it's some trivial fix and I just, I'm on a schedule. I, it's like something stupid that needs to be reverted for a release. Then I will commit it myself. But quite often I will like say, hey, this is my, my fix and I'll send it off to the real maintainer of that area and uh, maybe most of the time they commit it, right? So <laughs> I, I seldom get rejections, but, but uh, <laughs> if they want to improve it, that's fine too. So we are almost out of time. I, for, for very current reasons, I have one last question. And I've asked this question of Linus a few times when we've had these conversations. And I usually phrase this conversation what happens if Linus steps behind a bus? What happens with Linux? And of course, yesterday as we walked back from dinner, he steps behind a bus. I'm like, no! <laughs> and so what, what happens when, when, when there is no Linus anymore? Uh, you know, I'm fairly careful even when people are, no! Uh, no um, He's not. Uh, yeah. Um, I think it would have been a bigger problem 15 years ago, maybe even 10. These days, there are so many people who could take up the work, the mantle. Most of the people who could do it wouldn't want to do it, I think, right? <laughs> they, they've seen enough that they say, yeah, now it's better to let Linus handle it because there is going to be conflict and, and I don't need that headache. Uh, but there are clearly, I mean, there are people who have been around for almost as long as I have been. Uh, and there are people who are universally trusted and do a lot of the work right today that could step up. So, but my traditional answer is, hey, I won't care, so. Yeah. On, on that very helpful note, <laughs> thank you very much, Linus. Thank you, everyone. Hold on one, hold on one second, guys. All right. Let's give a standing ovation to this man, 25 years to continue to do the same job. Thanks for that. <laughs> All right, yeah. that's enough. I made him uncomfortable, so, uh, <laughs> but I couldn't resist. Thank you guys, thank you so much.